let us get sick. Don't let us get old. Don't let us get stupid. All right, just make us be brave and make us play nice. And let us be together tonight. Want to? If you believe that your health is important, there is always a way. And just like you know, like the Nike slogan, "Just do it." People who describe themselves as feeling lonely, the impact on their health is actually similar to the effect of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And so this will strengthen your leg muscles, and it will challenge your balance a little bit. Um, and so it's a good way to, to help build functional strength in your lower extremities. With this selection, I hope you got the sense that there's a variety of foods we should eat, certainly, but you're going to vary in terms of calories and the amount of protein, and you have to think about that when you're eating meals. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to the Zoomer, I'm Libby Snymer. More than 137,000 Canadian seniors were hospitalized last year, mostly because of falls. As our population ages, there's a renewed focus on frailty and how we can avoid this growing health crisis. Today, we've gathered experts on aging, wellness, and frailty to find out how to avoid becoming one of those statistics. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. As we age, we may start to slow down. But when everyday tasks like getting dressed or going shopping become hard to do, this could be a sign of frailty. Today, 1.2 million Canadians, 65 plus, live with frailty, as do their 2.5 million caregivers. Falls remain the leading cause of injury-related hospitalizations among Canadian seniors. This puts enormous strain on the health system. Canadians 65 plus account for 46%, nearly half of Canada's health care spending. Indeed, while no one likes to think of themselves as frail, with some forward thinking, many of the challenges that frailty brings can be managed or even avoided. Okay, so let's start with you, Dr. John Mouchedere. What exactly is frailty? So thank you. So frailty is a state of reduced health and function in an older individual. One of the hallmarks of aging is, is that it's not all the same. Some people age differently than others, and frailty encompasses a term of people that have reduced function and, and health. One of the other hallmarks of frailty is that they're is that people that are frail are much more susceptible to adverse uh, um, health events, for example, like the flu, like a fall, which may have catastrophic uh, consequences for them, whereas if somebody wasn't frail, uh, it would have very little, uh, very little effect on them. Dr. Barbara, um, in your patients, what would you see in someone who's frail? Would they shuffle instead of walk? What are some of those things? It's a constellation of different symptoms. It's actually a syndrome, and we think about it as a person as being vulnerable, vulnerable to stressors. And so those stressors, as John has said, could be an illness, like a, a, an infection or a change in their medications. But how it presents itself is that the person is not able to manage, not able to manage their, their functioning and their activities of daily living. They may be become confused, have decreased mobility and falls, may have trouble controlling their bladder or their bowel function. So the things that they have to do every day to look after themselves becomes compromised. And how would we recognize if we ourselves are becoming frail or, or our loved one is becoming frail? Like what, what would you look for? 
So there is a spectrum of uh, presentations that happen as a person becomes frail. Then there are some, uh, there's a commonly used scale that is available on the internet, the clinical frailty scale. And it starts with people from being very fit and well to being um, managing their chronic illnesses and then being slowed down and then starting to have trouble looking after their activities of daily living. The, the more complex activities of daily living are affected first. And then the more basic ones, everyday functions like dress looking after yourself, bathing, washing, um, feeding yourself, all of those things accumulate as, as the, per the person becomes more frail. Heather, you're a nutritionist, and one of the things that I notice as, as people get older is they take a lot less care with their meals and putting things together. So. I'm assuming that's a, a sign of, of frailty. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, poor food intake in general is one of the key things we see in weight loss as well with persons that are frail. But losing the ability to cook for oneself or a grocery shop, losing the ability to drive are often some of the early signals that there might be a challenge coming up. How would you know if it's, if it's not you, but that somebody is starting not to eat yeah. properly? Well, actually, that's a really good question. There's a few tools that are out there, screening tools that can be done by self-administration, even by a child with their parent. Um, one is called Screen. There's a variety of tools that are done with physicians as well in the offices that we can use to screen for nutrition risk. But I think in general, if you look for weight loss and a person not eating as well as they usually do, those would be two key indications. So if you have your mom or your dad over for dinner and they're complaining of poor appetite, not eating as well, they look like they've lost some weight, that's a good indication they might have some nutrition risk. We should get them to the GP or their nurse practitioner, get a screening done to demonstrate are they really at nutrition risk, assess them, have a dietitian see them, and get them on the track to better health. And Helen, Joanne, and, and Laura, so do people stop exercising or is it a matter that they haven't started? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that, you know, when you're younger, you take for granted that it's easy to do things. But as we get older, we lose muscle, we lose bone. Um, uh, it takes a little bit more work. Our heart needs to work a little bit harder to do the activities that we want to do. And so um, people then feel fatigue and then start doing less because they feel that they can't. Mm -hmm. And people lose muscle mass. I mean, Almost even definitely. fit people lose muscle, muscle mass as we age. Most definitely. You know, it's a proven fact that we do lose muscle mass, and we have to be proactive in making sure that we, we eat enough protein in our diet as well as that we do strengthening exercises, whether it's weights or just your own body weight, just to keep and maintain. You know, Hal and I, we're in our 60s, and we are starting to see the effects of aging, and we have to adjust our lifestyle, and I think that everyone has to do that is to avoid because those uh, symptoms and uh, of frailty can be avoided. And it really comes down to a lot of motivation for us. You have to be motivated and, and that's what we hope to, to get that word out to people that you know we want to avoid frailty and it really is about as we always say keep fit and have fun. I think it's about playing again. Yeah. You know, when we were kids, what did we do? We went out and played. We went out with our friends. And that's the thing with activity is if you uh, make sure that you are out with your friends to do an activity, you're more apt to do it. And you'll see it more as a, a way to interact socially. And that makes you feel good. It's, you know, the endorphin high. It's that being able to socialize with, with friends that make you feel good. Absolutely. That's, we're going to get into that a bit later in the show. The social aspect of things is also really important. And we'll have that and more when we come back. Stay tuned. One of the best ways to prevent falls is functional strengthening and balance exercise. So exercises that challenge your strength and challenge your balance. Frailty Network's Avoid campaign is all about avoiding the things that can make our immune systems, bones, and muscle health weak. And activity is one of the cornerstones of the campaign. So how does activity play a role in our overall health and avoiding frailty? 
So you talked a lot about falls, and one of the best ways to prevent falls is functional strengthening and balance exercise. So exercises that challenge your strength and challenge your balance. Um, and a lot of people get, when they think about strength training, they get a little nervous because it means they have to go to a gym and use lots of equipment. But you can think about it in terms of functional strengthening, aligning it with things you do every day. Right? So we think about a squat, we think about somebody with a lot of weight and getting down into the gym and that's really scary, but a, getting in and out of a chair is the exact same movement. So if, if it's hard for you to get in and out of a chair, then you start there. So you just, pr every time you get in and out of a chair, do it 10 times, right? So we're gonna get in and we're gonna get out. And you just stand tall, push through your heels, get back down, use the armrests if you need, and eventually graduate to not using the armrests. And you wanna pick an intensity where you can do an exercise maybe uh, 8 to 12 times. If you can do a lot more than 12, it's too easy for you. So you move on to a different version. So maybe you're going to do the squat without the chair, right? So you're going to sit back, right? Right? Just like that. So you're sitting back using your body weight as, as the weight, your body weight as resistance. And so you come down, and you come down as far as you feel that you're comfortable. Some people can get all the way down to here. But Got if you arthritis. can't, if you have yeah. arthritis or other problems that limit that, that's okay. Strengthen in the range that you can. Right? So if you can only come down here, then that's okay. Now, if you want a bit more of a challenge, you could pick up something, and it doesn't have to be equipment. It could be a bag of rice. It could be a jug of water. You keep it nice and close to your body, so it should be touching your body so it's not out here. So you're gonna have it touching your body. And when you think about doing a squat, there's a few key tips. So you wanna go about, uh, find a width where you can go nice and comfortable, toes slightly out, and you wanna have your knees come over your toes, and sit backwards. Some people will go like this, but their knees are too far forward, so you want to sit your bum backwards. You're doing that very well. And so this will strengthen your leg muscles, and it will challenge your balance a little bit, um, and so it's a good way to, to help build functional strength in your lower extremities. So another thing we need to do every day is get things out of the cupboard. Right? or reach up for something that's high in the closet. And what you'll notice is some people, as they get older, their shoulders tend to round, and then they can't reach quite as far as they used to be able to, or they don't stand as tall. So this, this exercise might be a good way to work on posture, um, as well as shoulder range of motion. So let's just start, we'll look at your range of motion here. And all I wanna do, no weight, I just want you to stand tall, tummy in, so imagine your belt's kinda coming up, stand tall, and just, don't bend your elbows, but just bring your arms right overhead. Okay, so you can see your range of motion is pretty good. Right, some people can only get to here. And so for those people, maybe just working on range of motion is the first step, right? Standing against a wall, trying to reach nice and tall, right? Now, if, that, if you're able to do that, then you might add a bit of a challenge. And so we stand with the broom just at shoulder height here, and we just press straight overhead. And so that should come right over your head, right? And you can just go up and down. You can do it with a cane, you can do it with a broomstick, a dowel, whatever you happen to have. And if that's too easy, then you might start with a little bit of a weight. And you can press that overhead. Or you can do one of those elastic bands and press that overhead. So Let's you can give that a try. It. So like this, I'm holding it yeah, right? Yeah, and you're gonna just put it right in front of you right oh, here, and then okay. just press straight up. Yeah, exactly. So, and that, yeah, exactly. That's all right, that's about the right weight. Yeah, and again, you wanna stand tall. You don't wanna let it topple you over, right? That looks great. And then if you want more, so you can buy those body bars that have a little bit of weight, or this one's actually really challenging. It's got an elastic band and a bar, and you can press that straight overhead, and that's even more of a challenge. There's lots, it's all the same movement, just different levels of difficulty, right? And you can do these sorts of things at home. You don't need a gym. But if you do go to a gym, there's an opportunity to get instruction and maybe try new challenges. So I have one more challenge for you if you want me to, you want to try it out. Sure. Another thing that we often have to do is carry groceries, right? Okay. And sometimes that gets a bit harder as we get older. And so... You could, this in the gym, we call this a farmer's carry, and you would use weights and you would hold them next to your body. And so I'm gonna use the water jugs to oh. show you as an example. So if I want to work on my posture and my abdominal muscles, I wanna, again, nice and tight through here. So Suck it up. My, yeah, bring my belt up, <laughs> right? I'm gonna stand nice and tall. I'm gonna rotate my shoulders so that they're nice and tall, I'm nice and aligned, and I'm gonna hold these just slightly away from my body, and I'm gonna take small steps 
work on my balance. It's really hard to do in heels. <laughs> and that'll also work my abdominal muscles, okay? So do you wanna give that a try? Sure. And you don't have to use weights. You can use light grocery bags with a few little things in them to make it heavier. Or you could do it with no weight at all. If you want more of a challenge, you can use dumbbells or kettlebells. These water jugs are pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot harder than you think, especially if you have to hold it a little bit away. Yep. Right? And so you can start with a small distance. Or even the nice thing is this is something you could practice every day. So the next time you do groceries, park at the end of your driveway and think very carefully about how you carry your groceries into the house. And that's your ab workout for the day. Right? So you don't necessarily have to go to the gym and just be purposeful about thinking about how you fit these activities into your life. Al, how did you manage uh, all the lightweight? I'm <laughs> 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 doing the work here. Okay, yeah. I'm putting these down doing now. Doing a great now. job, Jill. <laughs> and, and so remembering to do it eight or 12 repetitions. And if you feel that's too easy, like if you're do, you can do 15 or 20, you need to make it a little bit harder. Okay, we'll have more when we come back. Shingles in somebody who's older may cause really severe effects on them. But everybody who's uh, getting older should definitely have a shingles vaccine. and vaccinations may not be top of mind when you think about ways to avoid frailty, but they play a big part in maintaining your overall health and strength. So doctors, what does it mean to optimize your medications? Optimizing your medications means reviewing the medications that you're on to ensure that you still need those same medications and that the medications you're on are being given at the right dose and that there's no interactions between the medications that you're taking. So getting the most out of the medications, optimizing the chances that you're going to get benefit and minimizing the chance that you're going to have an adverse effect. It's, it's interesting. I'm familiar with that. It's called a meds check. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that uh, from uh, our radio call-in show, a lot of people are on medications for so long they don't even remember why. That's a, that's a common phenomenon. So sometimes patients have uh, been receiving medications for many years. And as you get older, um, the, the medical condition, the original medical condition may have changed. And the other important factor is that your body is changing. Your body is aging. And so the dose that you were receiving before when you were younger may no longer be the appropriate dose for you. So those medications should be reviewed in the context of everything else that is happening in your health. You have to look at each medication the disease it's supposed to be treating in the context of what's changing in your overall health. I remember a really scary study and it showed that um, a huge proportion of falls were caused by medications, benzodiazepines and also medication interaction. And I mean, it kind of boggles the mind that the stuff that people are taking they think to help them is actually doing the most damage. No, and, and that, exactly right, because that, what tends to happen as you get older and have more medical conditions, you're prescribed more medications, and what's not done as well is to look at whether all the medications that you're still taking are appropriate, and also recognizing that people that are older are much more susceptible to, to some of the adverse events uh, or uh, risks of medications than as, as opposed to somebody who is younger. So those are really important things. And one of the biggest thing is to make sure that the medications aren't interacting with each other, that the dose uh, is right because your weight may have changed, your muscle mass may have changed, so very important to have your medications reviewed periodically. And how often? At least once a year and whenever a new medication is added or when your health status changes. Do you find that sometimes people are very reluctant to go off a certain medication, especially if it's something like a sleeping pill or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, a, that is a challenge. So some people become um, uh, very 
very attached to certain medications that they feel are helping them. But as, as John said, as people get older, some of the medications that used to help you may actually be harming you as your body is changing as you're getting older. And sleeping pills is a, is a prime example, increasing the risk of falls, um, increasing the risk of confusion and cognitive impairment. What about vaccines? Uh, vaccines are really important as you get older, especially as you're frail. Your immune system doesn't work as well when you're, uh, when you're older, and there are certain vaccines, and, and if you develop infectious diseases, it may have uh, increased impact when you're frail. So the, the vaccines that are really important are the early influenza vaccine. If you're younger and you get, uh, have the flu, you may be sick for a couple of days, and you go back to normal. If you're frail and develop the flu, you may be sick for a long period of time and never actually recover your function from having that influenza. It's, it, it's huge. Huge. Uh, I know that about 3,500 people a year die in Canada from flu, from in influenza, and then another huge number lose their independence. They can't go back home after that because they're so compromised. What about other uh, vaccinations? There are two pneumonia vaccines. Yeah, so, the, the, um, so there's pneumonia vaccines that prevent some of the pneumonias. They don't prevent all of them, um, but certainly as you get older, and if you, especially if you have respiratory problems, it's very important to have an pneumonia vaccine. And the other vaccine is uh, the shingles vaccine, which is um, uh, shingles in, in somebody who is older may cause really severe ef uh, effects on them. Uh, may have lifelong pain uh, requirement for for pain medications, which may increase your risk of delirium or or, or confusion, and and they're very effective. So everybody who's uh, uh, getting older should definitely have a shingles vaccine and a pneumonia vaccine. Uh, so here's a question. There's a new shingles vaccine that's been shown to be much more effective. So do people who have had the older shingles vaccine, that's the Zostavax, should they also get the newer one, which is Shingrix, I think? I think it has to be evaluated on an individual basis um, in terms of the risk that that person has and the other diseases that that person is managing in terms of their overall health status. But generally speaking, yes, the newer one uh, is more effective and is the recommended uh, vaccine. Well, I think it's important to make sure that all the other vaccines are, are up to date. So, for example, tetanus, uh, that you per have a periodic bo uh, booster, uh, diphtheria, all those other vaccinations. And that's, that's a conversation to have with your medical doctor and make sure that all those vaccines are up to date. Okay. When we come back, the impact loneliness can have on aging Canadians and frailty. That's next. There's also a lot of myths, like so people think, you know, I have arthritis, therefore I shouldn't do exercise because it's jarring for my joints. And actually the research suggests that exercise in people with arthritis will reduce pain over time. Emphasis is being placed on social interaction as we age. Loneliness can affect many aspects of our health. So what have you found in your patient population? So more and more attention is being paid to the effects of loneliness on health. And it um, affects not only the mental health of the individual, but also, surprisingly, the physical health of people. So. People who describe themselves as feeling lonely, the impact on their health is actually similar to the effect of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of the impact on cardiovascular health, on your heart, and overall mortality. I would imagine that eating together uh, would go a long way. So does that fall by the wayside when family moves away? Or Absolutely. And so we know, for example, when people lose their spouse, they often go through a transition with their eating and they have to rethink how they do things. And if they don't think about an adaptive way of eating that actually is healthful, it can lead then to some of these other changes along the line in terms of physical changes, weight loss, etc. So it's important for sure. And, and that's why being active as much as possible and finding activities that you can do with others are, as opposed to solo activities, like going out for a, a walk by yourself isn't nearly as enjoyable as, um, as going out with someone else and talking. And you realize 
that by yourself you might might go you know, a, a kilometer around the block. You go out with somebody else and you've just done three kilometers, but it wasn't exercise. Mm -hmm. It was fun. It was enjoyable. And I think that's, we are, the, we are our own health advocates and we have to incorporate as many healthy things into our lifestyle as we can. And I think that's really important. So how do people start? I mean, I would imagine that part of the problem is that people kind of lose the drive. You lose a spouse or you lose, you lose your friends. And you kind of don't know where to start. Like, where where do I get the walking buddy or the, you know? Yeah, I think um, what's nice is a lot of uh, community centers will run exercise programs that are also social so that you could potentially uh, find people that you might be able to be physically active with. They also often run classes. So for someone, for example, who's at risk of falls, there are some places that will run classes specifically geared towards working on balance. And so you could go to that and learn some exercises, but then potentially meet some friends. So I think it's uh, getting out to some of those programs to learn the exercises, but also to find folks to to do them with. And what you're trying to do is create new habits and by signing up for a, a class what you're doing is creating a trigger that tells you at one o'clock I have to get ready and go to the class and then when you're there that's when everything just evolves and everybody is intimidated the first time you go. And to feel, to, to make sure that, or you say to yourself, hey, it's okay to feel intimidated, fear, um, not sure whether or not I, I want to do this. That's natural. But if you take that first step and, and set these triggers in motion, you will benefit tenfold by, by doing that. And one of the other ways to to reduce social isolation is is to volunteer, is to uh, is Great to point. do things that uh, that increase your self worth, that uh, they leverage what you've done in your in your prior life before you may have retired uh, to to help other people out, and and that's a great way to to reduce social isolation and also help other people out too. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is to just start to have a conversation. So recognizing what loneliness is, what that feeling is, and talking with people around you, with your friends and your family and your healthcare provider, and looking for help. Because I think that there are um, things that should be addressed. So if, if that is a symptom that someone is experiencing, it goes back to the assessment. So what things can be improved to help make it possible for you to go out more, to be engaged socially, to do different activities. So there may be things in medications that need to be reviewed, optimizing mobility and pain. There may be issues around transportation. All sorts of things can impact on that. And so going back to what can we do to make things better for you so that it's possible for you to go out and have social engagement. It's interesting in, in Britain they now have a minister of loneliness and they found a huge number of people who basically said that that they go for days and weeks without any contact with with anyone else. If you want to, if you believe in, in, that your health is important, there is always a way and just like you know like the Nike slogan, just do it and that's what we have to do. So there's also a lot of myths, like so people think, you know, I have arthritis, therefore I shouldn't do exercise because it's jarring for my joints. And actually the research suggests that exercise in people with arthritis will reduce pain over time. And it may be a little bit painful to get moving, but over time the exercise will actually benefit, especially if you combine strengthening with aerobic activity. So both types of exercise can benefit. If you like one better than the other, you can start with one and maybe add the other one later. So um, it's really important to know that Age does not preclude you from participating. So it's not just getting older that says, okay, I got to ease down. It, it's even if you have things like arthritis or other conditions, there are ways to adapt exercise or make it uh, accessible to you so that you can, can participate. I, I find the worst thing for my arthritis is sitting yeah. uh, and not moving. But it, before we finish with this subject, the one thing I want to bring up is mental health. So, I mean, getting people to the point. I mean, how much does that play into it where people are isolated? So mental health is a, 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 an issue relate, very closely related to loneliness and social isolation. So depression in older adults um, is 
in the range of 5 to 15 percent of the population is affected by depression in their older adult years. Some of those individuals have had depression for a long time through their younger adult years and it's still present with them as they're getting older. A smaller number developed depression for the first time in their older adult years and I think it's important to recognize that it, the, getting back to that assessment if the person is having symptoms of loneliness and, and difficulty getting engaged socially look at what might be contributing to that because it might be something that's treatable that you can modify in terms of a risk factor for that loneliness. Okay. When we come back, we'll discuss diet and nutrition. That's next. And one of the key things that we should know as we age, we actually need more protein. So once you hit the age of 50, 60, you actually need more protein than someone who's younger. We often don't realize that. We know that what we put into our bodies has a huge impact on our overall health, but it's important to know what to eat when it comes to staving off frailty and the health effects that come with it. I'm joined now by Professor Heather Keller. We have this uh, array of healthy things. Exactly. So let's talk about it. Well, I wanted to emphasize for you today protein. So we think about protein specifically when we think about frailty and because protein is basically needed for muscles, right? And muscles are needed to keep us moving and doing the things you want to do. And often when we don't have good muscle strength and good muscle um, mass, it leads to us falling, leads to us having some challenges. Even breathing, quite frankly, gets harder when we don't have musculature in our abdomen. So I want to focus on protein today. I also just want to mention calcium and vitamin D are two nutrients we often also think about when we think about frailty. But protein, I've got a selection of foods here that all have protein in them. I want to talk about how much protein we need, and the differences in the type of protein that we have here. There's lots of interest in plant-based proteins recently, and so I want to talk about some of those differences here. So what we've got is um, what we would consider animal-based proteins. Here we have, uh, we have a piece of steak, a piece of chicken, and some tuna fish. Can you tell me which one do you think is the most protein on these three here? Any ideas? Well, from, from the portion size, yeah. probably be, maybe. Actually, they're all the same, okay, or very close to it. Now, which one would be the less calories? It might be the, no, it won't be the tuna, will it? It actually it is. is the tuna. It is. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we can get protein from animal products pretty readily, right? Okay. So they're often the highest in protein that we would consume in our diet. But they're different in terms of calories. And so you want to think about choosing high protein sources that also don't make us go overboard in calories because if we go overboard in calories and we have to burn those calories off in some shape or form or we tend to gain weight, right? And so tuna here, chicken, this is uh, chicken leg, but if you imagine it without the, the skin on it, it's actually a very good choice. It doesn't have the skin on it, lower in fat, and then steak. Red meat will be higher in fat, obviously, more calories, right? But all of these are pretty equivalent in terms of the portion size here, the amount of protein they would have, but the calories are gonna be different. So I'm gonna switch now to what we would consider the legumes, nuts, yeah. seeds, that sort of grouping here. We've got almonds, we've got a cup of almonds here, half a cup of chickpeas, a cup of lentils, and two tablespoons of peanut butter. And also then finally, edamame dried, which is like a, a soy nut, yeah. right? Um, so these two we would often eat as snacks or on salads and things like that. Similar with chickpeas and lentils, you might cook with them in a curry, or a chickpeas you might actually roast or put on a salad but they're all a little bit different in protein content and calories, and I will talk about that. But also they are different from the animal products, so they have different nutrients, right? So there's gonna be fiber in these nutrients, or in these foods. These ones don't have fiber over here, right? They also have some phytochemicals, antioxidants that are relevant for our body, whereas over here on the meat side, we're gonna get iron, right? We're gonna get some other B12, some other nutrients that are common in animal products. So here we've got chickpeas, as I said, pretty high in terms of protein, but to get the same amount of protein as here in the animal-based, a lot more calories. So this here is a half cup, it's 360 calories. Okay? Wow, that's a lot. So exactly, so you have to think about, you know, how much calories you're also taking in, in addition to the protein. Uh, Almonds, a lot this of is calories. a cup, yes, yeah, 600 calories. Great for fiber though, certainly a great source of vitamin E. it's good fat, right? It's good fat but you have to think about using it judiciously so you don't actually go overboard with the calories, right? 
but it certainly is good choices for sure. Lentils, also a good choice, lower in calories, but also lower in protein. So a cup of lentils here has only got about 18 grams of protein, whereas over here we've got about 28 grams. It's a full cup, is about 230 calories. So similar calories, but less protein. And then peanut butter, well known to be a little bit higher in fat, of course. Really tasty though in your smoothies or on your toast. But you have to be cautious of how much you eat because it has that really good fat for sure, also a bit of fiber. And but it the protein, doesn't look like a lot in there. No, it's no, only it's two a... tablespoons and that's only um, basically about eight grams of protein. So it's not a lot of protein compared to the animal-based ones over here. I want to switch now to tofu. And actually, tofu is, is, um, comes from soybeans, right? It's actually an excellent source of protein. It's considered equivalent to animal-based proteins with the types of amino acids that are in it. And it's actually quite low in calories. So if you can think about choosing and learning how to use tofu in your diet, it's a great source of protein. It's great for other nutrients as well. And it's also a lower calorie option. Here I've got quinoa, and so this is a grain that um, often people think of as being very high in protein, and certainly it's got some great benefits. But to think about the amount of protein you need, you need a lot of quinoa to make up for the protein that would be here in the animal base. It's actually a seed. Yeah. Well, it's a grain, grain-like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but it um, can cook as a grain, use it like a, uh, like a pasta substitute or a rice substitute, right? And eight grams of protein basically in a cup. So that's not as much protein as the animal-based or the tofu would have give you, right? Let's switch now to the uh, dairy products. And so we've got cottage cheese here, another great source of protein for the calories. You get 23 grams of protein in a cup here and only about 207 calories. So very comparable to the lean choices of tuna and chicken. You can use cottage cheese in so many ways, right? Breakfast, you can put it into a smoothie, you can cook with it in your lasagna, your vegetable lasagna, etc. Right? What we need on a daily basis is about 20 to 30 grams per meal. And one of the key things that we should know as we age, we actually need more protein. So once you hit the age of 50, 60, you actually need more protein than someone who's younger. We often don't realize that. So if you're a 70 kilogram person, that's about 152 pounds, 55 pounds or so, you need 84 grams of protein a day. And you want to choose good quality proteins like those on the table here to make that need up. And so that's about 20 to 30 grams per meal. So if you think about our breakfast, that would be having this cottage cheese with our piece of toast and butter, right, to get that 20 to 30 grams of protein. And maybe you might have um, a dairy or um, a turn of beverage in your um, coffee, for example. So you have to think about how to get that protein on a routine basis, not just one meal. So this doesn't look like a lot of steak, right? No. No, but this gives us all we need for a meal, right? So we have to think portion size when thinking about some of the higher calorie options that are out there too, to think about what, how much we really need to, to build our muscle, okay? I want to switch as well just to talking a bit about um, yogurt. So there's a variety of yogurts on the market, right? And we've heard about Greek yogurt. Yeah. yeah? Greek yogurt's about double. Um, the amount of protein. And so it is a very good choice. Just watch the amount of sugars that are in the product um, because you don't want to, again, have too I much sugar in your diet. The difference is the way. Yeah, so it actually is concentrated Wait, more. So, so it's, it's okay, actually, they remove yeah. more of the fluid, quite frankly, as well. Okay. So let's sit longer and, and it actually is more concentrated, right? And there's a variety of yogurts and other types of beverages like that. I was just looking at the labels to get a sense of how much protein you get for that serving size and how many sugars you're getting in there as well, because often they're flavored. I see that you have 2%. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what you recommend for a plain yogurt, 2% or uh, there's 3.25%? Yeah, and so um, certainly dairy is, is an animal fat that's in there, right? But it's actually, those thoughts that it's actually helpful to have a bit of fat in your diet to help the absorption of specifically fat-soluble vitamins, right? And so sometimes if you want to make sure, it's, it's okay to have a 2% yogurt for sure, much creamier as well, uh, but there's also skim milk versions. If you're really concerned about calories, that's one way to address that. I find though that if you get some of the flavored that are the skim milk versions, they often have lots of sugar in them. Yep, so you're not the, gaining on the, you're, you're losing out on the a calories A lot of there. low fat products end up with a lot of sugar. Exactly, and, and exactly, salt. to make them tasty, right? Yep. And so that, that processing adds to the calories that you don't want in that way. The last thing I want to talk about is our alternatives for dairy and also using milk itself. So milk, a cup of milk here is on in the cup there. That's about eight grams of protein, okay? And so if you had uh, a cup of milk with your breakfast, maybe some toast with some peanut butter, you're getting close to your 20 grams of protein for breakfast. Now I'm emphasizing breakfast because that's often the, the meal we tend not to get enough protein in, right? So um, that a cup of milk, 2% milk there has eight grams. Here we have an almond milk 
and a soy milk. Do you know how much protein is in almond milk? It's only got one gram yeah. for the same volume, right? And similar amount of calories. The soy milk on the other side actually has the same amount of protein as the cow's milk version. So if you don't or can't uh, choose um, a dairy uh, beverage, a soy beverage would be better than almond milk or the other nut milks that actually have very little protein in them. So again, reading your labels carefully. One thing that I like about the um, beverages is they're now also um, fortified for vitamin D and calcium, which is essential as well for bone health and for, for fall prevention and frailty. So that's really good to see. So with this selection, I hope you got the sense that you use a variety of foods we should eat, certainly, but you're going to vary in terms of calories and the amount of protein, and you have to think about that when you're reading labels. Okay, when we come back, we'll have some final thoughts from our panelists. That's next. Beth was in our audience for the show and had this to say via email. No one really thinks about the psychosocial repercussions, for instance, depression and isolation from an injury or fracture. We shouldn't let ourselves get boxed in when these things happen. Recovering and moving forward with our regular routine is the goal. In a previous episode of The Zoomer, we discussed fake news. Rose wrote on Twitter, it's a scary thought that we may not be able to fully trust what we hear on the news. It seems that a lot of news outlets are focused on their political agenda instead of unbiased reporting. Hashtag fake news. Keep the comments coming in and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and via email at rsvp at zoomermedia.ca. Don't forget, for free tickets to the show, go to www.universe.com and search Zoomer Media and log on to www.thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more. Welcome back to the Zoomer. It's now time for final thoughts from our panelists, starting to my left. Thank you. Uh, the final thought is that frailty is not an inevitable part of aging, and there are practical and uh, things that you can do to avoid the risk of becoming frail, and if you are frail, there are things that you can do to reduce its, its progression, and that's, uh, I think, it, I've really enjoyed being part of this panel, which has how it highlighted those things. Thanks, Libby. I think the um, main thing is to start a dialogue, have a conversation with your health provider because you shouldn't attribute symptoms that you're experiencing to aging. You need an assessment and things can be done. Laura? Yeah, I think it's important to challenge yourself to be physically active every day. Get your heart and uh, lung, your heart pumping and breathing harder for at least 20 minutes a day. And at least uh, twice a week, challenge your balance, challenge your muscles, uh, build strength, maybe do some functional strength training. You know, I think it can all feel very overwhelming, but I think if you keep it really simple and start just one little step at a time and incorporate something new into your, into your day, into your lifestyle, uh, the rewards will be there. Yeah, and you really make your health a habit and uh, make it the most important thing because if we rest, we rust. And so we don't want to do that. You've got all the best lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heather, following up with that. Um, so I, I think, you know, I think the key thing I want to say is that if we think about frailty, nutrition risk or malnutrition go hand in hand. And so if we see someone who's frail, they're often malnourished as well. And so how do we stop that? We think about eating well, eating with others, thinking about diversity and trying to keep it uh, fun and keep the motivation going to stay well. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you to everyone on the panel. And in the words of that great Nike ad, just do it. It's time to zoom out. <laughs> <laughs>